This week, the State Public Education Department released the latest data on teacher evaluations. Most teachers were rated effective or highly effective, but debate over how teachers are evaluated is far from over. This spring on New Mexico in Focus, we heard from students who walked out of class to protest the new park exam, and New Mexico Education Secretary Hannah Scandera sat down with us to talk about testing and teacher evaluations. This week, producer Sarah Gustavus brings in some local teachers to get their take on the issue. Now I know every teacher has an opinion about teacher evaluations and the park test. Wish we could have them all in here, but we have a group here today from different schools with different perspectives. Thank you so much for joining us. Sarah Winsett, special education teacher at New Futures. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Sean Thomas, social studies teacher at El Dorado High School. We also have Celeste Hernandez, fourth grade teacher at Lou Wallace Elementary. And Marissa Silva Dunbar, language arts teacher at John Adams Middle School. So teacher evaluations came out in the press this week. I understand you haven't seen your evaluations yet, mm -hmm. but you certainly have things to say about the evaluation process. Sarah, why don't you start us off? What are you going to be looking at when you see your numbers this year? What's kind of going through your mind right now? Well, I'm confident about the things I have control over, my observations and my lesson plans. Um, I've done really well on those in the past and last year and this year, but the test scores and so much of our evaluation being based on test scores because I teach special ed is really detrimental to my evaluation. And last year it harmed me quite a bit. I don't know what it's going to do this year. And Celeste? I'm, I'm kind of concerned because the media gets our evaluations before we do. That's, that's a big concern for a lot of teachers out there right now. Nishan, actually they, overall for the state, most teachers were effective or highly effective. Do you think that those numbers are gonna be the same in your school? I, you know, I think, it, I think they will be, which just proves you know, the, the whole voice of accountability is we've created this value added model that nobody can explain and it doesn't make sense. And then in, as a result, those those teacher evaluations, those teacher numbers don't make any sense anyways. So yeah, I mean they're gonna the statistics will stay the same. Marissa, your thoughts? Um, I'm definitely curious. I'm a first year teacher, so I want to see um, what my evaluation is. Um, but I also feel like our principal has been very supportive. Like she talked to us a little bit about the evaluation today, and she said, you know, I expect. Um, I have high expectations for my teachers and you meet them and so I, I think that was very positive support to hear from her. There's so much talk in the media this is such a big issue it's got national attention the park test and teacher evaluations and the connection between those two are you nervous getting those evaluations for the first time? Definitely, definitely. How was administering the park test for you this spring? Um, there were, it was pretty easy. There were a few glitches initially. Uh, I was left alone to proctor by myself, so I had to be on my feet uh, f most of the day, which is fine, but you have to keep an eye on every student, make sure they're on task, not make sure they don't have any electronics. So definitely it was a lot of work. And Sean, what about you? I, I, it was terrifying. I think one of the most terrifying about the things about the test is the fact that math and English are what's primarily tested and the fact that to do that, it ruined months, months of curriculum time in those classes. So the things that we supposedly value the most are actually getting less time to teach their kids. But shouldn't the kids already be ready for the test by the time they take it? Or do they still have things to learn this year that you think should be on the test? Kids always have more to learn, first of all, and they're being tested over not necessarily the math they took or mm -hmm. anything like that. So. What about, how, does, how did it compare to previous tests? Preparing for the park, preparing your students for the test. Well, for instance, as bad as the SBA was, which was the standards-based assessment that we did previously, that took a week. And yeah, it shut down the schools, but we got it over with and we could go move on, get back to our classes and actually teach because that's what most teachers care about. And uh, instead, it, it messed up schools for two solid months. We've heard from Education Secretary Hannah Scandera that there's fewer tests and they're actually you're spending less time on the test. Are you saying that's not accurate? That's not accurate at all. And if she would come and watch what, I, what it actually does to the school, she would see that it's a way bigger disruption than it's ever been. Sarah, there's some special concerns for your students, uh, special education students. What was it like for them taking the park test? Well, I have students who have mild to moderate disabilities, and um, sometimes it's a birth defect or a brain injury, and their academic skills are do suffer. So I have kids who are working from a third grade level to a fifth grade level, even though they're in high school. They're on an alternative pathway to graduation, but because they're in 10th grade, they have to take the algebra test. Because they're in 12th grade, they have to take the algebra two test. 
Um, obviously, they don't do well on these tests. It's not the curriculum I'm working on. I work with them on their IEP goals, which is under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, we do work with the standards with our students to give them access to the same standards, but I don't expect them to perform at a college and career ready level necessarily. So for my kids, this, this can be really upsetting. I've had kids cry. I've had a student get up and leave and never come back. I don't know what happened to her. Um, this year it was a little, um, because it was new and stuff, so there were some exciting things about it, but the modifications didn't work correctly. And once they start, they can't change them. So I had a student who, um, this, this brightness of the screen she wanted to adjust, once they start, they can't adjust the volume. They can't adjust the brightness of the screen. So she's looking at math she's never seen before. The brightness is hurting her eyes. She doesn't really know what to do. Um, I tell her, you know, try to reason your way through it. But she really doesn't have a chance. And what's the point of that? It's just mean to make her do that. And then to use those scores to tell me that I'm not necessarily an effective teacher is mean, I think, to me, too. So, you know, we got through it. Some of my kids are going to do OK, um, but I have lots of students like that. And I really, it really makes me sad to have to make them do this. Celeste, what about at the elementary level? What did you see when students were taking the test? I noticed that there were some students that got through it really quickly, like 10 minutes. Um, there were some students that went right up against the, the time limit, you know, 75 minutes, 65 minutes. A lot of those kids didn't know what they were being asked, and they sat and just looked at the computer with just sort of a deer in the headlights look because they just didn't know what was happening. Now, the, the, the students who went through it really fast, what do you think the technology, we think of young people, they've been around technology forever. They, this should be so easy for them. Do you think it helped or it hindered them in the test taking process? Um, I think that kids do have a sort of technology savvy to them, but they don't necessarily know the skills that are required to take the test. Um, there was a lot of dragging and dropping and highlighting and moving and um, typing the text boxes, those kinds of things. Those aren't necessarily skills that kids use on an iPad or kids use when they're playing computer games. Um, they're very test specific questions. So to take time out from my day to teach those skills to a student takes time from science, math, social studies, reading, all those things that I don't think we, we didn't ever have to do them with the ESB. They took a pencil and wrote what they had to write and that's, you know, that's okay. Anyone see any benefits of, of a test like PARC? Is there any, any positive potential outcomes? I, I personally think that if we use testing the way that they were initially designed, which was to use them as student learning objectives. So we found out where students were weak, and then we as teachers worked together to develop curriculum that supported the students and their weaknesses. That's where testing has a strength. Mm -hmm. But when you tie it to teacher or school or teacher evaluation, what it really does is create an us versus them mentality where teachers see kids as the enemy, kids see teachers as the enemy, and administrators and teachers can't communicate at the same level because they're trying to achieve different goals. But if we do student learning objectives, that's a solid use of a test. Sean, what do you think makes a good teacher? I think the biggest thing is so much of what you can make up for is by being there for the kids and being compassionate and understanding where they're coming from and understanding the kids. I think one of the biggest things is, for instance, like multiple assessments and differentiation of education. The really funny thing about education 10 years ago was it was all about how do we reach the students you can't typically reach and how do you find new ways to teach them and new ways to assess them. And now we've totally scratched that and said kids are all the same, they're all robots, they should all learn the same, they should all be able to regurgitate the same information on the same mm -hmm. assessment. So it really is, there's a totally different philosophy that's been adopted in the last 10 years. Marissa, I see you nodding your head quite a bit there. Uh, yes, and I want to piggyback off what Sean was saying earlier about uh, how testing can be used to strengthen what students are weak in. The problem with the park is we don't get the feedback until next school year. So that's an issue. So I might see, OK, my students need to grow in this area, but that won't affect them until next year, and they won't have me anymore. So I can't really adjust my teaching at that point in time. I still give formative assess assessments in my classroom, but that's not necessarily going to reflect on the scores. So I can adjust my teaching in my classroom, but not for the park.
Just through tests on maybe a lesson plan or a six-week plan? Or even like in, in formal assessments, I might say, have them fill out a muddiest or clearest point. What don't you understand? What are you completely confident in? Could you explain this to someone else if you needed to? And they can fill that out. And if there is mass confusion, I can reteach it in a different way. I can even ask some students who do get it, what's a way I can teach this? So, but we can't do that with Park. What do you think, uh, Celeste? Um, I just, I think that if you ask any teacher on any given day where, where are your students strong and where are they weak, mm -hmm. they can always tell you. A good teacher can always tell you. Mm -hmm. I don't need a test to tell me in November of next year mm -hmm. where this group of kids is headed. I already know. And I could tell you on any lesson that I'm teaching. Um, and I think that's what good teachers do. We, I check in with them all the time, several times a day, several times an hour, and I can I can tell you. I can tell you which kids get it and which kids don't and which ones are struggling and where they're struggling. And I don't need a standardized test to tell me that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what kind of testing would work for you and your students? Well, I do collect data on my students. I do specialized curriculum for special education students. And we do a level testing at the beginning of the year. And throughout, as we work, I collect um, their progress. And I have beautiful graphs that show um, <laughs> that, that my students do indeed increase a lot of skill levels. Um, I, I, it's funny because I watch them approach that grade level line and usually by now we're right underneath it. So the, we went from being about 60% below grade level to about 10% below grade level as a class. That's great. But we're still below grade level. So as far as my evaluation goes, um, I'm not doing very well. My students aren't at, at grade level. I asked them if they'd stay another six months, but they declined. Yeah. What, is success, <laughs> what does success look like for your particular groups of students? These are students who are behind it on mm -hmm. grade level. They're also parents or, or right, pregnant right. and going to have children. And they have jobs. And that really is the kind of success for a lot of my lower level students that I want for them. To find employment, they can support themselves and their families. Um, they may pursue secondary education. There's assistance for people with learning disabilities at that level too. But they have to go at their pace and, and focus on what you know, their interests and goals are at. Um, they're not necessarily you know, going straight into the university to be great students. Um, but that doesn't mean they won't be successful citizens and taxpayers and parents. Sean, you want to add something? Yeah, I just, I mean, I think that's where we're going. You know, I, most teachers would probably agree with the statement that, that that's our evaluation. Our evaluation is how well do we assess our kids, how well do we change our curriculum, and, how to, and, and what do we do about it. You know, Sarah earlier said that the stuff that I feel like I can control, I'm confident in, and that's the sign of a good teacher. Um, and that's what the evaluation needs to become, uh, not on something that I have no control over, but what am I doing in the classroom? You know, sometimes it's enough, and this is something that I, I feel like policymakers don't understand, that if I can get a kid who had 32 absences semester, last semester to just come to class every day, mm -hmm. that's a success that will never be recorded on an exam. But you know what? He's not doing drugs when he's in my class. He's not loitering some business when he's, you know, with me. And so, you know, there's, there's those intangibles that may not be measured, but, you know, you can measure. I can show you a lesson plan. That's something I have control over. You can come in and watch my report with my kids. That's actually something you can measure. And so there are a lot of measurable factors that we can use for teacher evaluation that's within our control. And that, I think that's what we're trying to do. You know, I think policymakers are really, they're looking big picture. Though. I mean, our students in New Mexico on the whole are, are behind some other areas and, and there's I think a real genuine desire to help our students really improve in school. How do you how do you bring the two of those together, this need to what you were just saying, but also with the need to big picture, someone's got to be held accountable here. True. But not every you know, the the idea is that everybody who's part of this process is accountable. From the policymakers to the teachers to the parents to mm -hmm. the students. That's not the way that our policy is driven. Our policy is driven is that teachers are responsible and accountable for every aspect, which would explain why we teach sex ed and why we have a nurse on campus and why we pr provide free and reduced lunches. I mean, you look at public education, you're really gonna tell me that a system that provides all those things for kids and we really are the safest place that those people can be, that, it's, that we're failing our kids. And on the top of that, I'm gonna add that, and, and this isn't because I have very supportive parents, but if teachers are so bad and public schools are so awful, Every parent that sends their kid to public school is not doing their job. And so we can't have your cake and eat it too. 
we are either a system of good or not. And I think we're a very good system of good. Celeste, are your students bringing some of these, Sean's alluding to these social issues that we definitely have in New Mexico with poverty, Absolutely. with all these issues families are facing? Absolutely. Poverty is huge. At, at my school, which is a downtown urban school, we have kids who are homeless and we have kids who are doctors and lawyers and judges kids. So we run the gamut at, at the Wallace and it's, it's interesting to watch all those kids um, sort of interact together and they know, kids know, and, and kids know when they're lacking and kids know when they're not. And it's, it's interesting to see how they interact together and how they're sort of, you know, just helping each other out. And those kids really, I mean, that's what they want to do. And for somebody to say that kids that come to school hungry are going to do just as well as kids who have everything in life that they could have are going to score the same on a test is just a ridiculous statement. I can't imagine that that would, that's just not right. Marissa, do you think that there's a need to address at a policy level these other issues? I definitely do. Um, sorry. Uh, there's a lot of variables at play, and right now we're only looking at teachers, but there is socioeconomic, there is motivation, there's skill level, there's parenting, you know. We're, but we're the only ones being held responsible. So if they don't have the support at home, I can tell which students do have the support at home within my classroom. They're the ones that definitely turn their homework in on time. I can always call their parents if I need to. There are other ones where it's, def it's difficult to get a hold of the parents or they don't turn in their assignments. So they don't necessarily feel like it's th that they have to because it's not um, reinforced at home. So that's an issue as well. So, but again, um, sorry. But again, the schools that have more resources also have parents that are invested more, unfortunately. To wrap up here, I want to know what's one thing that you want policymakers at the state level or at the local level to hear from you as a teacher right now moving forward, uh, especially on, on evaluations and testing? Sarah, do you want to start? Well, I welcome being evaluated. I evaluate myself all the time. I analyze my practice and my lessons, and I differentiate for each student. Um, I welcome being evaluated. I want to be evaluated on what I do, not on some mm -hmm. test score. <laughs> I think that's the big thing is I, w I would love for somebody to come and walk in our shoes for a week and see what it is we do all day, every day. Um, and it's not just from the time the bell rings to the time the day ends. It's after school. It's before school. It's late at night. It's going, you know, your family doesn't have a car so you want to take them home or you know those kinds of things and it's not a test score isn't all that I am. Mm -hmm. My big message is it's not political. Education shouldn't be political. Mm -hmm. We should recognize that it is a myth that our public schools are failing and that we do need to reform and make them better just as you would do in any profession you're always trying to do better. But the myth that, that we're failing has created a political issue where, where it won't win. We've been under the same system of testing for over 10 years now. If it's not working, find something else. I would say that most teachers do want to be evaluated. I agree with what everyone else has said. Uh, there's always room for improvement, and I think good, the good teachers will look for it, not just with, through self-reflection, but through others. There's so much more here to talk about. We will continue to um, cover this issue here on New Mexico in Focus, but thank you all for being here with us this week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.